Happy Father's Day. Even if you're not a dad, you know that you have fathered many in your life in the faith. God has used you in a mighty way. This morning we are going to be in God's Word and we are going to be looking at the Lord's Prayer. Wait a second, I hear some of you, just like my wife, say this. You already preached on the Lord's Prayer already. What are you doing? To my wife and to many of you here, thank you for remembering. I really appreciate that. It's very beneficial. Thank you. This week, we're going to look at, briefly, prayer, the Lord's Prayer, how to pray. And the reason why I'm doing that is because we find that where we were in our context last week in Luke, and now when we're coming over to, again, Luke chapter 11, verses 1 through 4, we can find here how our hearts can be filled with joy, can be filled with peace, and it is found in God alone, in Jesus Christ alone, and none other. When I read the New Testament, I read over and over again for Jesus, the battle was prayer. That's where the battle took place. Prayer was like running the marathon, and the ministry was just going to receive the gold medal. Prayer was always a battle. You would find wherever you find Jesus throughout his word, throughout the gospels, he's in prayer. We find that the disciples come to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John has taught his disciples to pray. Pray. For Jesus, prayer is a battle. Something that he did on a regular basis. Now, if you look in Scripture, where did Jesus sweat drops of blood? Look at these knowledgeable men and women that we have here today. Unbelievable. Where? In the Garden of Gethsemane. Now, think about it if you were there. And you're following him. You gave up everything you have. And you're following him. He's going to be your deliverer. And here he is, sweating drops of blood. And what is he doing? Hey, this guy's just praying. How's he going to function when things really get bad? Now, that's kind of how they're thinking. But remember, what happens? When Jesus stood before Pilate, when Jesus went up the hill of Calvary, how did he respond? He responded. He was girded up. He was secure through prayer. Prayer was the battle. Prayer is what brought him the victory. Prayer is what enabled him to stand firm. And you find in scriptures, in, in the book of Hebrews, it tells us that Jesus gave strong cries and tears as he made his petition to God. Now, if I had been there, I would have used some words that I probably shouldn't have used. Here he is, sweating drops of blood, and all he's doing is praying. You know, when you read God's Word, and you study God's Word, and you see how committed Jesus was to praying, and I look at my own prayer life, and maybe some of you here are very similar to me. I have been very intermittent in my prayer life. I sometimes fear that I can grab hold of the hem of the garden garment, but I never fully mastered it. Because prayer is a battle. Prayer is difficult. And sermons like this part of the sermon is sermons that I love. You know, when you're talking about someone else's sin. Oh, those are great, those are great sermons. Oh, talk, even the pastor, he has struggles with prayer. Oh, let's go talk about it today. I told you to be 
He doesn't do this. Struggle with prayer. Never fully got the grasp of it. Never fully taken hold of it. I'm a work in progress when it comes to that. But Jesus as my example, Jesus as my Savior, reminds us that prayer is the battle. Prayer is where we should be. Prayer is how we should live, how we should move and have our being. We should be a praying people. You look through the book of Acts, you look through the church as it began, they didn't have a blueprint on how to do things, how to make decisions, how to deal with the persecution, how to deal with the suffering. But you know what you find over and over again in the book of Acts? That the church gathered continually in prayer. Continually in prayer. Prayer was what was their blueprint. Now we see here that the disciples have been with Jesus now for two years. And it's a little over two years and they have watched him over and over again go out into the world and constantly witnessing him praying. Praying to God. Praying over and over to God. In one sense we find in verse 1 of chapter 11, one day Jesus was praying, praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples, or a spokesperson, or whoever it may be, said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples to pray. They had been with him for two years. They had a front row seat. They didn't ask Jesus, hey, teach us to preach. Hey, Jesus, teach us to teach. No, they didn't ask that. Teach us to minister. No, they didn't ask that either. Jesus, teach us to pray. Instruct us how to pray. We usually come to someone and we ask what is their specialty what is an area that they can be most of a blessing to us, an area of expertise, they come to Jesus and say, Jesus, teach us to pray. Teach us how are we to pray. Now, if you don't know it or not, in the Old Testament and other places, there used to be uh, what's called 18 benedictions that everyone used to pray uh, continually. And then you can see here that John also taught his disciples to pray on a regular basis. Now they come to Jesus. Teach us, Lord. Teach us to pray. And what does Jesus say? Jesus begins and says, when we pray, we are to start with what? Father. Jesus says, when you come, come to pray, you say Father. He said to them, when you Pray, say, Father, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come. Sing it with me. Uh, pray it with me. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins. For we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Different versions. Teach us to pray. So Jesus begins to teach them to pray. And he starts with the word Father. When you approach God, approach Him Father. Affirming that at the heart of the universe, there is a merciful and loving God who desires to hear from you, who desires to communicate with you. It's a reference to a great deal of in intimacy. So when you pray, Jesus says, say Father. That is the single most important word in this section of Scripture here. The single word sums up all the basic thing about the Christian faith and our relationship with God. When we come to the creator of the universe, 
The one who took all the galaxies, all the planets, all the stars, and threw them into space. We come to a God who loves us, and we are to approach him with a term of intimacy. Father, we are expressing our faith behind everything there is. He is the ultimate power and the ultimate love. And he tells us, come, say, Father. You know, in uh, Psalm 121, it's, uh, it says, I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He who made everything is a God who loves you, who treats you as his son or his daughter. Come to him. Pray in that manner. In the Old Testament, there's only seven times that you can find in the Old Testament that the people of God, and it was only the nation of Israel that approached God as father because as the nation, they brought not in a personal way. Not one example can you find of Abraham, Moses, Daniel, Joseph, Mo praying to God in their tent on their knees and addressing God as Father. But Jesus tells us when we go to pray, the word that should come easily from our lips is Father. Now the Jews of Jesus' day were hesitant to take the word of God upon their lips. But then Jesus comes along and in almost, and in almost every single incident in Scripture, when he prays, he calls God Father. He addresses him as Father. Even more startling is the fact that when Jesus prayed also in Aramaic, he would pray Abba, Father. And Abba, Father, it's like Daddy, but it's not Daddy. Because if, if you approach it as Daddy, it is really not reverential enough what it's saying, but it has the same sense of endearment, of tenderness, of love, of intimacy. Perhaps the best rendering would be, Dearest Father, when you pray, the first word that is to come to your mouth is what? Father. That means you see yourself as a beloved child of God who delights in and who welcomes you. That means you come to Him with complete confidence and trust. Absolute security. We're only able to do that because of Jesus. Because of Jesus and all that he did on our behalf, we're assured of the Father's love because of what Jesus has done for us. When we trust in Christ through the Holy Spirit, God comes to dwell within us and he nurtures in us this tender spirit of sonship, of, of being a daughter of God. In Galatians 4, chapter 6, Paul says, because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his own son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. When you pray, come to him as your father. You might not have had a father in this life who you felt secure with. You might not have had a father who was around all the time. You might not have had a father who never told you he loved you. You may not have had that. But scripture reminds us that our heavenly father loves us securely, tenderly, consistently, and forevermore. So never judge your heavenly father by your earthly father, but judge your earthly father by your heavenly father who loves 
perfectly and consistently. The, uh, Larry Crabb, many of you have heard of him, he's one of the uh, more famous Christian psychologists that you will find. And he wrote in one of his books a story about one of his friends that he grew up with who was raised in a very angry home. And Crabb writes about how this young man, whenever he was home, he would be yelled at, he would be screamed at, he would be in a real tense situation. But down the block, there was a home. And at this home, when the family got together, there was laughter, there was joy, and there was love. And this young man, as he was growing up, used to go down the block, crawl under the porch, just to listen to the laughter, the love, the kindness that was coming from the home. And Larry Crabb turned around and asked him, if they would have had invited you up from under the porch, to come and join them when they gave you that invitation, would you have taken it? He said, in a minute. In prayer, God invites us, each one of us, to come up from under the porch and into his presence in prayer and in intimacy. Come to him as Father, as your heavenly Father. It's not a place. It's a person. So as you talk to God, you address Him as Father. And talk with Him, we are told, we're to say, Father, hallowed be Thy name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive others. And lead us not into temptation. The prayer is divided into two parts. The first part focuses on the Father, and the second part focuses on us. The order and logic of it is critical. Jesus says that when we come to the Father in prayer, we should talk to Him about Himself. We should talk to the Father about the Father. Hallowed be thy name. Father, your name be high and lifted up. Now, now before anything is said about me and my needs, which we don't have much trouble going to God and asking God about me, myself, and I, and about what is going on in our own lives, that's rather simple. But here, we're told that before we even come with our own needs, we should come to God speaking about Him, giving Him reverence, giving Him glory, giving Him honor. Now, when, when you read this, anything like me, what is hollow, right? What, is, what does that mean? I don't have a clue. Well, it basically means to hold God in the highest reverence and honor and give him glory in everything. It is, he's holy, he's set apart, he's someone special. Now part of the prayer, what it does is as you focus on God, talk to God about himself, part of the prayer is to reorient your perspective away from yourself and to God. Sometimes I think Prayer is not so much changing God, but God changing us, moving in us. Let me give you an analogy that I always was very helpful to me. When you pray, imagine there are three shelves, then on the top shelf, on the very highest shelf, shelf, you find there eternal things. There you find uh, inherit you find salvation, giving glory to God, all these heavenly, eternal things. 
the most meaningful things of all. And his, that's where you find it. That's why when the Apostle Paul speaks to us and he reminds us in other occasions that we would know the glory and the hope of God. That we would understand that. So when we come to him, we come to him with that mindset. Father, may your name be hallowed. May your name be high and lifted up. So uh, but that's the top shelf, eternal things. Then you go a little bit lower now on the second shelf. Now on the second shelf, these are really important things. Like when you pray, when you pray for your kids, when you pray for your children's future spouse, you pray for their salvation, you pray for that they may have a life filled with joy. All important things. That they may have a good friend, a good spouse. Things like that. That's the middle shelf. Then a little bit lower, there's the third shelf. And that is all about circumstances. The circumstances of your life. Lord, I pray that I can get that job. Lord, I pray that Barbara Lucchese, you don't know, you don't know I did this, but I'll let you know, would call me again. She didn't call me after a couple of months. I pray that maybe my wife would not pick on me like she used to know. Not, not bad things, but not always eternal things. Good things, very good things. Circumstances of life where you live. That's so easy to pray for, so easy to deal for, because that's, one, it's all about you. It's all about what's important to you. But here we're reminded that we are to keep our focus on God. And when we keep our focus on God, we, we realize that in life, and just like when you put things on the shelf in your house, the things on the top shelf are usually the things that are most valuable but hardest to get. They're the things you can't see. Salvation, when you pray for eternal life, when you come to a Bible study, you will find that most every one of us will pray. What is the most important thing we pray for, usually? For our spouse or our children or our friends? Salvation that they would come to know God and that God would move in them. When you give your focus to what's on the top shelf, then you're able to understand what God's purposes are in your life and or everything. So we have to work at it, but it's worth it because what's on the upper shelves are really the best things. And remember, the stuff on the upper shelves lasts the longest and satisfy the most. Always putting God before you in prayer. I also think the secret of unanswered prayer comes in that. So you would find, like with the Apostle Paul, for example, remember the Apostle Paul had a thorn in his flesh. And he prayed over and over again, God, remove that thorn in my flesh. Do you remember that? And what did God say? No. He says, my grace is sufficient for thee. He wanted him to focus most on his Father in heaven. He wanted him to focus on God. The top shelf, God says no to this in order that something greater can be accomplished. That's why in this prayer, Jesus starts by saying, reach for the top shelf. Reach all the way up. Now, the substance of prayer is his name. Hallowed be thy name. In those days, a person, 
name had something to do with their character. Like today, we name it after our rich uncle Billy Bob or our rich aunt Peggy Sue. In those days, when you named your child, you named them after someone who had tremendous character. That's what you would name someone after. Hallowed be thy name means you're speaking about someone's character, who they are, how great they are, how wonderful they are. We're praying that God's person, God's character, his reputation would be seen for what it is. To be hallowed means to be reverenced, to be honored, to be set apart and holy. So we're praying that in everything God would be reverenced, honored. A young boy went into the little local store with his mom and as he went into the local stop, store, the owner of the store went up in his jar and picked out a whole bunch of candy. They called them suckers, I don't know. You know. And he went up to the young boy and said, here, young man, this is for you. And the young boy wouldn't take it, wouldn't take the candies, wouldn't take the suckers. He just backed away. So the store owner just took it, put it back in the jar. And as they left, the mother said, this is the first time I've ever saw you be shy. Why were you so shy with that, with that man about taking the candy? He said, did you see how big his hand is? I couldn't fit that in mine, so I didn't take him. When you see how big God is, how big he is, you know what you have is not sufficient. God is bigger than we are. God is our dear father, but he's not our old buddy. Please don't think that way. In our society back then, they never thought about it that way. You would never hear someone say, well, the old man or this one uh, here. It's a term of reference. reference. When we think and when we pray, Oftentimes, we make other names higher than God's name. We reverence other things more than we reverence God. God's name is above every name and in which every knee shall bow and tongue confess. One of the easiest ways to seek God's glory, this is very practical, and if you want to try it, Whenever you're praying, add the term, so that. Okay? When you're praying, so that. To all your prayer requests, add that. God, eradicate the cancer from Colleen, from Flo, Rakita, Brian, Courtney, so that people can see your power. God, to all the countries who are experiencing devastation from COVID, especially in India, keep your people healthy so that they may bring forth the gospel to the end of the world. Father, please provide for my family so that we can tell everyone that you are Jehovah Jireh. Father, God, pro provide for those who are in great need during this season so that they may know that you're a God who is near. Resolve this week that when you pray, you pray, Father, hallowed be thy name. And when you pray, God, heal, move, do something wonderful so that your name, your name will be high and lifted up. Let that sink in. The first thing, the head of the list 
the one above all others, the most central, most supreme, most encouraging, most encompassing, all influencing, is that God's name will be lifted up. I think Jesus tells us this because he, he knows that doing this forces us to think more about others and God than ourselves. We don't have a hard time doing that. Praying for God's glory above all else means you are, you are forced to stop and think about what is God's purposes in this? What is he doing? You have to wonder what the world would be like if we really revered God's name, that we put God's name above every name in everything we do. We're going to stop here this morning, and we'll pick this up in a couple of weeks as we go through the Lord's Prayer. Sometimes when we start with the top shelf, meaning God, His name, it's a little more, uh, I don't know how to say it. Uh, we're not going to be as wrapped up in the bottom shelf, let's just say, on the basic circumstances of life. But when you think about it, if you lived in a world where God's name was hollowed, where God's name was lifted up, you most definitely would be living in a world that was filled with joy. It's like when a child, I'm going to, uh, I, I hope you don't mind. Too. Uh, I remember I was in the Walt Vogel house and uh, Tim's daughter, Ren, wanted something from Tim. So I'm sitting there and I'm watching, right? She wanted it, so she's running towards Tim and I'm watching. But when she got to Tim, instead of saying, give me this, she jumped in his arms. And I was watching that. And she was, she was hugging him. Because you know, all of a sudden, she realized, whatever she thought she needed, I have everything I want right now. Because I am with my dad. That is really what it's like. You have everything you could ever need, anything you could ever want, when you're in the arms of your loving Heavenly Father. You have everything that you could ever desire when you're resting in Him and lifting up His name, for that's what you need. You need a life that brings glory to God, top shelf stuff. When you pray, may my life bring glory to your name, you're reaching for the top shelf. Bring glory to God, praise to God. Jesus tells us when we pray, the first word that should be on our lips is Father. Intimacy. A perfect, loving, heavenly Father. Let us pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for how you bless us and look after us. Thank you for Jesus, the author and perfecter of our salvation. We ask God that, in, that we would become people of prayer, that we would talk to you about you before I talk to someone else about someone else. In all that we do, God, may we be prayerful people. In the name of Jesus, we ask this. Amen.